The time has finally come when people all over the world can join together and celebrate and encourage companies, municipalities and organizations that do their utmost to fight climate change. And the time has finally come also when we can call out the ones that don't. A warm welcome to this launch and this conference hosted by We Don't Have Time, where we're going to launch this fantastic app. Because we don't have time to wait, but there is still time to act. And on this flat platform, we will also be able to launch fantastic climate ideas. My name is Katharina rolf stotter Johnson. I am a moderator, lecturer and writer focusing on climate change action. And with me next to me here, I have Ingmar Rensog, the founder and CEO of We Don't Have Time, and Frida Berry-Eklund, who just like me, were both founders of the Our Kids Climate Coalition. Uh, Frida, you'll be hosting the uh, stage here, the moon stage, and I'll ask you a little bit more later on what's going to happen here. But Ingmar, first of all, what is We Don't Have Time? We Don't Have Time is a new social media platform where we together can do climate action. And tell us more about the app. How does it work? And where do you download it? Uh, you download it on your phone. So search for We Don't Have Time app in your App Store or Google Play. And you're ready to go. And the easiest way to explain what you should do on our platform is actually to show it. Please, go ahead. But not so boring on the computer screen, a little more interactive. So let us begin. What you could do on our platform is that you could send great climate IDs to organizations, political leaders, and the people in power. If we have an ID, for example, how a big corporation could go fossil free in just one year, they just have to change some things in their business model. Uh, I could send this ID to that big corporation. But they will, don't, they will not care because I'm only one person and they will think I'm a crazy person so they will like throw my mail in the spam folder. But here's the thing. If we get together on our platform, we could agree on this ID if we think the ID is great and realistic. And if enough people, all of you and people on the internet, agrees on this ID, that company will not ignore that ID. They will probably start communicating with us and perhaps implement that ID to go fossil free. So that's how we could give organization IDs how to go fossil free much faster. But it's not all about IDs. We also need to stop doing things. And here is the climate warning. And if I send you this, you will not like it. This is not great to receive. And it's the same thing one more time. If I only is alone sending a climate warning to an organization to tell them to stop, they will ignore me. But if I'm 10,000 of people that are doing that, it's hard to ignore. So, perhaps they are going to change and stop doing what they were doing and people wanted them to stop with. So what's happening now is that we could give that organization mm. climate love. Mm. Because if they do great stuff, and it doesn't matter if it, they did wrong stuff yesterday, it's the mm. future that counts. Absolutely. We must encourage them whoever they are. Mm -hmm. And this is the same thing. One climate love is nice to receive. But if you receive thousand love, you will probably be addicted and do more great stuff mm -hmm. to save the planet. Be very so, happy. So that's the And the, com the competitors will be envious. Yeah, exactly. And they want to change too. Yeah. I guess. Competition mm -hmm. or doing good. Mm -hmm. Great. So if you have questions, for instance, uh, how this works and how you can get involved, how do you, how do you work that? Uh, as every social media, mm -hmm. you can interact, you can share and you can comment, etc. And for this event, if you download the app and, if you, and every new user on our platform is automatically following We Don't Have Time info account. And here is the Q&A. So just write your 
a question you have for any of our speakers to this conference, and they will try to answer you uh, on stage or later. Mm, great. And I understand that there are different levels for the campaigns that will be launched here. How does that work? Yes. Uh, we can have a quick look. As mm -hmm. you see here, this campaign is uh, soon, soon going to level two. Here is one that soon goes to level one. Again, I, I like to explain this in a little bit more concrete way. Mm -hmm. So we do like this. All right. If 100 people agrees with your campaign, we will send out, the platform will contact that organization and tell them that 100 people give you love, warning or ID. Mm -hmm. It's still quite easily to ignore. So when 1,000 people agrees on this, we will start marketing that campaign through social media. And we will not just target our 700,000 followers, we will also target the company's customers, uh -huh. their employees, and perhaps maybe their employees' families, sure. their kids, because it's their future, mm. right. Mm. And we can go on. 5,000 agrees. We make some beautiful infographic, perhaps a short social media movie. 10,000 agrees. We will have someone writing an article about this subject, trying to contact and reach out to the reception of the campaign uh, and make them talk if they don't already do that. And the final stage, and we will add campaigns and we will change the numbers as we're growing, but the final stage, 100,000 agrees. Is That's serious pressure. It's serious pressure if you get 100,000 people giving a warning. Mm -hmm. We're going to start a PR campaign. And we are really creative. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of people that help us do this. So you can't ignore it. That's the point with the levels. Very exciting, Ingmar. And I know for sure Frida Berri Eklion here at the Moon stage. This is sort of the, the heart of the launch at this stage. We have another stage, Town Hall, where I'll be um, hosting. So Frida, what's going to happen here today? We are going to be launching 26 campaigns on this stage today. So the, for the first time, we're going to have 26 simultaneous campaigns running on this app. Wow. And you'll be joining us later on the other stage to, to tell us a bit more what's happening. I'll been be joining here. you and I'll be reporting back how it's going. But the main thing is that people need to start agreeing and liking these campaigns so we can get the numbers off and um, get them off to a flying start. And we did already. Yeah. Wonderful. Well. Good luck, best of luck on this stage here, uh, the moon stage. And I'm going to um, run over to the town hall stage and we'll meet you later on. See you there. Have See you fun. There. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, we are going to continue. Uh, yes, Frida. So tell me a bit, so can anyone start a campaign? That's the point. It's not just campaign makers that could do this. Everyone could do it and it's really easy to do it. The only thing you do is you press uh, the post button and you choose campaign and you choose if you're going to show now ID or, or warning and when you're ready to, to go. Uh, so it's really easy to do that. Uh, and it's not all about putting that really brilliant campaign up with long text and description. It could just be do something you see in the reality because everyone, everything is going to show here nearby, so we could interact with uh, uh, the real world where we actually are. Uh, so it's not just going after the very big global corporation, it's also going, not after, but communicating for everyone in the city and where you live. Uh, and when you give away this um, uh, campaign, it's also a score. So. Marie Stahl Commune here, uh, they will probably get a lot of climate love, as we've seen earlier. And maybe an oil company may be not going to receive so much love, and we can see that as a rating platform like TripAdvisor, etc. So we, what we have done here is uh, we have combined the Twitter platform to discuss things uh, with TripAdvisor, platform where you could rate things, with uh, signature sites where you could uh, agree on issues but not just what you need to stop, but also what you think is good out there. So we're actually doing something totally new here. But what's the goal? What's the big goal? Uh, 
Uh, so stop the climate crisis. The big goal is uh, to be enough people, and we need your help. We need you to help us invite friends to be used from this platform. We also need your help to tell us how we should build this, because this is just the start. We can't do it yourself. We're inviting you really early in this project. Uh, and the goal is to be the power of many, so our leaders will has to change, and we need to build a fossil free future. And can you target anyone with a campaign? Like, say, I go into Starbucks and they have really bad recycling. Uh, and you want to do something about it? You could target any company and any public figure. So you need to be a public figure or an official company or organization. Uh, so you, I can't target you. Or is you a public figure? <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Ingmar. Yeah. Let's continue. This is so exciting. I'm now passing the art exhibition here, the, the posters, and this is called Plaza Mayor, and this is going to have some mingling doing on, going on later on. And I'm headed up to interview Kathleen Rogers. She's president of the Earth Day Network, and it is, of course, not a coincidence that we're launching this platform on Earth Day. And Town Hall stage is waiting here. It's full of people. Great to see you. Here we go. <laughs> Wonderful. And you're already here waiting for me. Great. Wonderful to see you all. Kathleen, yes. president of the Earth Day Network. I'm so excited to have you here. And Kathleen, please tell us about the network. So, uh, 1969 was a period of incredible civil unrest in the United States. We had the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam War. We had the civil rights movement, and we had the legacy of about 150 years of industrial development. And combine those three things together, uh, and sort of an intrepid young man named Dennis Hayes and a senator, Gaylord Nelson, came up with the idea to create teach-ins were at university campuses, but the idea took off once they changed the name to Earth Day. And 20 million people came out on the street, which was about 10% of our population at the time, uh, in what is still the largest civic engagement event in human history. No other time has there ever been one place with 20 million people doing one thing. And we had a paranoid president at the time, Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. who was quick to react to create the Environmental Protection Act. We had an enormous number of uh, senators, bipartisan, hard to believe, that created a whole system of environmental laws, the Endangered Species Act, Clean Air, Clean Water, Toxic Control Act, and a number of other uh, environmental pieces of legislation. And by the way, embedded in that was the right to sue the government. Citizens had that right. Uh, and it's how I made part of my career, suing the federal government and state governments and actually internationally. But um, out of that came Earth Day Network, and we grew. Um, we went international in the late 70s and early 80s. And now we're in 190 countries in various degrees, some incredibly intensely, like India and China and the United States, Canada, Brazil. Um, and it is a day, um, we never use the word celebrate. It's a day of action. So mm. uh, we are grateful to see what's going on in London, although it's not 100% tied to Earth Day, it's sort of that primordial spring when people are really super active. So we're excited to see so many people engaged worldwide now um, in Earth Day, and we hope to have a billion plus people at least, maybe two billion, uh, for the 50th anniversary, which is next year. Wonderful. And I know you talk about critical mass movement. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, um, I was born with a little cape on my back, and I'm perennially, pat maybe pathologically optimistic. Uh, but I do feel we've been doing multiple generations since the first Earth Day, mm. and we have not really created a cohesive movement worldwide. Uh, sitting in our audience was a major player in the climate agreement, Nick Nuttall, who's working with Earth Day now. He'll be joining us later in the panel. Oh, good. Mm. And... Um, he uh, and together the countries uh, opened for signature the climate agreement on Earth Day in 2016. But we've all seen um, people moving away or backwards. And so we have this ebb and flow, two steps, one step forward, mm -hmm. one step back. And we sort of inch forward 
But given the what's happening in climate change, species decline, glaciers melting, and all the things we hear about every day, um, it's really important that we build a cohesive movement, one that doesn't isn't separated by continents, but joined together by social movements. So I was really excited um, to come to Sweden of, um, to celebrate for um, Earth Day or to begin this process of joining those people together. So this is sort of a piece of news that you're sharing with us here today? Yeah, um, so I've been involved in politics a long time and we do voter registration and get out the vote because unlike most countries, you actually have to register to vote, which is a cumbersome, difficult process mm. and you have to re-register every time you move. So we've done that. Um, with groups like the NAACP, black and Latino groups, uh, because our mission is to diversify the movement. Um, it's a fairly white movement in the United States and one that's been also not tied to your vote. Um, and so what we found, and we do exit polling uh, around the world, including Sweden, and we have found that in no country, uh, not this one, not the United States, not any country, mm. is environment, climate, energy in the top five issues of what you're interested in in a political candidate when you vote. I think it's 17% it's of people crazy. make it number one in Sweden, and the vast majority of those people are young, and many of those are still not voting. So um, we've decided to create, uh, along with many other groups, a campaign called Vote Earth, uh, which has just taken off. We're starting it in the EU with parliamentarian elections, uh, but it'll move worldwide. In 2020, uh, Earth Day, the 50th, will come in the middle of our primaries in the United States. And it will also come when 60 other, 66 other countries and then hundreds more as we move through, depending on the cycle, state and local elections will happen in 2019, 2020, and 2021. So this campaign will last with all of our partners sort of indefinitely. But the critical point is to connect your vote to the outcomes that you can predict when voting for a candidate around those issues. And to date, it hasn't happened, and we mm. think it'll start today with this campaign and with Vote Earth. That's amazing news. Thank you for sharing this. And I know you're not just here in Europe to meet us and to launch and to, to be here, but you're also going to meet the Pope. Yes, I've met him a couple of times. He's a really nice person, looks you in the eye, totally disarming, is right there with you. And he's been a big supporter of Earth Day. He's always tweeting about it. We've had big events in St. Peter's Square. And I'm hoping that we'll see big commitments from the Vatican and other faith-based organizations. Uh, the Sikhs just committed to go plastic-free mm. in honor of the 50th in their temples and also uh, among the 25, 30 million Sikhs. Um, so many religions are sort of jumping, faith-based groups are jumping into this. We hope the Vatican will mm. as well. Mm. Great, wonderful. So, uh, Catherine, have you met Tessa Khan? No. You will very soon. We're just testing uh, here in my in-ear. We're testing her Zoom. She's with us here. Um, she's going to give an instruction speech on why we need a movement. And Tessa Khan is a fantastic woman. She's an international human rights right. lawyer, and you know that, of course, and co-director of the Climate Lit Litigation Network. And... Uh, Tessa Khan has spent decades uh, working in the global south and the global north, um, advocating uh, legal rights for and also peace and justice rights for and uh, economic equality for, for these groups. Um, and she will be giving a speech here now in any minute, and uh, then we'll have a little chat with her uh, online afterwards. Great. So we're going to move over to the side so she can have the stage. Please give Tessa Khan a warm welcome. take this off. Thank you uh, so much, Katerina. Um, I can't tell if you can all hear me. Can you hear me? Great. Um, thanks again, Katerina. I'm absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Um, I don't want to spend um, too much of my precious time rehashing the evidence that we're facing a climate emergency. I think that more and more people already accept that climate change and the pace at which global average temperature is increasing is a matter of fact and not one of opinion. Um, but just to drive the point home one more time, I want to show you a very simple and I think powerful graphic based on the World Meteorological Organization's annual global temperature data set. So let's see. So you can see that each stripe in this picture represents one year, starting 
at the year 1850 and ending at 2018. Now the cooler the tone, the cooler the year, and the warmer the tone, the warmer the year. So what you're seeing is a clear trend of increasing warmth with a series of record hot years since the year 2000. We also know that we need to rapidly transition away from our current level of greenhouse gas emissions. The IPCC's most recent report, as I'm sure you also know, made it very clear that to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, a threshold, by the way, that already entails catastrophic consequences for many people, we need to reduce our levels of global carbon dioxide emissions by roughly half by the year 2030 compared to 2010 levels. So now that we've set that scene, rather than focusing on those facts, what I want to focus on today is who exactly got us into this disastrous mess in the first place and how do we get our way out of it? Um, and not just to a place that looks like a slightly less precarious version of the world that we're living in today, but one that fully realises a vision of global justice and solidarity and equality. So how did we get here? Let's be clear that amid all of the important discussion of individual contributions to climate change, and I want to return to that discussion at a later point, um, there is no question that the causes of climate change are structural. Our reliance on fossil fuels is the result of economic and political structures that have been created and sustained primarily by two groups. One, the fossil fuel industry, and two, our national governments. The role of the fossil fuel industry in this crisis has been very well documented. We know for a fact that some oil and gas companies have known um, as early as the 1970s, or sin rather since at least the 1970s, um, that the products that they sell lead to climate change. And yet they've continued to make immense profits from the sale of those products. And they've used their power and influence to sow doubt around climate science and lobby against climate action. National governments have not only known about the problem for decades, but for the last 25 years or so, they've been making formal commitments to do something about it. Um, in 1992, governments created an international treaty in which they agreed to stabilise the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and prevent dangerous levels of climate change. In the decades since 1992, they have adopted numerous other decisions and agreements in which they've not only recommitted to that goal, but they've also accepted that among other things, rich countries should take the lead in reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, and that the sooner you reduce emissions, the cheaper it is to do so. And yet governments have willfully prioritised at the same time corporate interests and they've held back the transition to a just and sustainable world that we know is economically and technically feasible. So how do we change the system? Um, well, as a climate change lawyer, I of course believe that the law is one of the powerful tools that we have to compel the action that we need. The clearest example of this is a lawsuit that my colleagues at the Agenda Foundation filed in 2013 against the Dutch government. As a result of that case, um, the government was ordered to significantly reduce the Netherlands greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. The impact of that case has been absolutely transformative. Um, aside from shutting down coal-fired power plants in the Netherlands, it's transformed the conversation around climate change there. And it's reinforced the understanding that governments have failed to act on this issue despite decades of commitments to do so. Cases with similar demands have now sprung up all over the world, including in the US, Belgium, Colombia, Ireland, France, and at the EU level. More importantly though, we know that the power of these cases are to create lasting change comes not just from the arguments that are made in court, but from the movements that they can create and support for justice and political and corporate accountability. And I think that that's where all of us and our power when we act collectively comes into this picture. We may be up against institutions with massive amounts of wealth and influence, but those institutions depend on our complacency 
and our perception that we're powerless. And as so many emerging movements have already shown, whether that's students walking out of school or people occupying streets or decades of resistance by oppressed communities all over the world, we have an extraordinary amount of power actually when we act together. Um, and that doesn't mean that our individual choices don't also matter, especially if we're part of the world's richest 10% whose individual carbon footprints are 60 times higher than the poorest 10%. But individual and collective action, I think it's important to understand they are not mutually exclusive. You can take responsibility for your personal carbon footprint and you can also fight for structural change. And ultimately, we need to exercise all of the power that we have as voters, as consumers, educators, activists and as workers to emerge from this crisis with a foundation for the just, sustainable and beautiful future that we know is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tessa Khan. Tessa, we are launching a all year round platform today here. We don't have time platform. What would you say is the importance of having a 365 days a year, 24 seven um, thing going on, uh, pressure putting, being put every day, every hour. What would you say about the importance of that since we're launching on a specific day, Earth Day? Yeah, well, look, I think that, you know, we've gotten to the point and we may not have been at this point when Earth Day was originally launched, but we've gotten to the point where we've recognised that a safe and stable climate system is necessary for us to enjoy our human rights um, and to really sustain our welfare in every aspect of our lives. So I think that now in any conversation about how to protect and advance those rights or how to create a more equal or more fair society, um, you know, climate change and the natural systems that we depend on, they have to be a part of that conversation every single day of the year. Kathleen, any comments? Um, turn this off, sorry. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's it has to be continuous. I mean, there's a big discussion, and I think it needs to be had, about combining this uh, work. Is it working? Well, well actually. I'm super inept in this. I no. can sue lots of people. That's all right. You could just talk in mind, because um, that's supposed to be, okay, uh, they, they, they take care of it. Here's a hand mic. Never touch those. That's a good rule. Here we go. <laughs> uh, so it's a combination, in it's on. my view, of um, Further up. Boots on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, meaning protests and in people's faces. I hate to use that expression, but it works. It's time for that. And, uh, and platforms. So you have a combination of consistent action, whether it's through social media, uh, boots on the ground, voting, all of those things. The critical issue for me, and I've been doing this quite a while, it's been two generations since the first Earth Day. I wasn't around for the first one. Uh, but... I think the important thing is to, to try and understand why it hasn't become cohesive, mm -hmm. why it isn't so powerful that political leaders are afraid of us, because that's what it's all about. If they're not afraid of whether we'll walk away on a mm -hmm. vote or if corporations aren't afraid we're going to walk away from the voting with our purse, then we have to work harder and be more cohesive. And so we're really working more and more globally to knit these efforts together. And um, I think the combination of litigation, boots on the ground, and a social network platform is just the trick. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Tessa Khan and Kathleen Rogers. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. We're now moving into um, we're now moving into the first act. This was the introduction piece, and we have with us we assume uh, we have with us uh, Perspin Stockness to do a keynote presentation. Hello, Perspin. He is with us, Hello. he was with us. Um, uh, he's with us from Oslo via Zoom. Uh, I'm sure he's gonna come back any minute. I'll just give his introduction here. Uh, Peres Stoknes, he has a PhD in economics and he chairs the Center for Green Growth at the Norwegian Business School. And he also spearheads the Business School's Master of Management uh, program at the Green Growth um, uh, Institute. And Perespin is also a board member of the We Don't Have Time. There you are. Great to have you. And you will talk about social tipping points and how about how to create critical mass. Uh, please give Perespin Stockness a warm hand.
Thanks so much for having me. <clears throat> About 11, 12 years ago, I was involved in an initiative we called uh, the One Degree War. It was a plan to be used when the world was finally waking up, when a majority of people would say that enough is enough. We demand real climate action now. Stop warming, get CO2 back to 350 ppm. And the plan starts with halving uh, emissions globally over five, just five years. Back then, we imagined that 10 years off into the future, in 2018, there would be so much warming extremes that we would reach uh, such a social tipping point. So are we there now? You see, in all cultures, there are certain issues that most people agree not to speak about. We live with a certain knowledge that is painful, threatening to speak of and act upon. This is what states of denial are about, to both know something and then live as if we do not know it. I think Greta Thunberg hits the nail when, with her intense plea, we have to treat the crisis as if it is a crisis. So, let's run this. I hope you can see the slides. Um, Social tipping points are the sorts of periods of breakthrough when such hidden knowledge becomes broadly acknowledged. Denial is broken after a long period of normalization and resistance to it. And history and social science have studied a long range of such social tipping points. For instance, when Rosa Park went up to the white section in a bus in Montenegro, in Montgomery, sorry, in 1955, she kickstarted the civil rights movements. A bit later, in the 60s, in the Vietnam War, you were considered unpatriotic in the US if you didn't support it. But after a while, after intense work from a committed minority, and when this picture came along, it was an event that tipped it. And within the war, within a year afterwards, the war was ended. Similarly, we saw in the Eastern Bloc at the end of the 1980s, uh, unraveling, sudden, quick, of the communist states. And um, people knew when they were living there that the system didn't really work, but everybody went on as if it did work. So that was the kind of double life, a denial. But at some point, enough becomes enough, and suddenly the wall toppled. We saw the same thing with apartheid in the 1990s, a bit later. At some point, apartheid became enough. People just don't want or accept to live with it any longer. More recently, quite a few people have studied the change in attitudes in the US when it comes to same-sex marriage or equal marriage rights. And for a long time, uh, it hardly moved the needle. Most people were opposed to it, and this number of states that accepted it was very low. And in 2004, George Bush even won his election partly on homophobia. But then, hard work, a few days later, 2011, 2012, we saw this spike. And suddenly, by 2015, it was universal, and the majority is now supporting it. In the EU, we had the same situation when it came to the outbreak of the Syrian war. Um, there were millions of refugees, but Europeans kept it at a distance, a psychological distance. It didn't really affect us until suddenly uh, this image of the boy Alan, the Syrian boy who drowned and was carried ashore, that did something to really, really change how we thought about this. And suddenly Syrian refugees were welcomed to a larger degree we also had this event, sorry, what was that in there? Um, we've seen this repeatedly elsewhere. And in this graph, there's a definition of what we can call the tipping point. Um, for a long time, at the beginning here of action, as you can see down here, um, there is little impact. People keep working, keep working, keep working, but you can't really see the needle moving much. But then there is this point 
of action where suddenly you have a big impact. And people commonly use the word critical mass, something that comes from game theory, uh, particularly evolutionary game theory, um, to discuss how big does the critical mass has to be in order to have this sudden shift on the S-curve, where small actions or continued actions have much bigger impacts. And one recent study um, from the uh, published just this summer in the science came up with a number of 25% actually. It was based on field experiments on the internet on social naming conventions. What the majority calls something, and then they had introduced a committed minority. This was the study by Santola, uh, increasing the numbers upwards towards 25%. Suddenly, when you, the size of the committed minority reached that proportion, um, then the whole population or participants were changing their naming conventions to this new name. So this was a scientific study to see the actual dynamics, how it works. Other studies of uh, peaceful mass movements have found smaller numbers. For instance, just the rule of 3.5, when the 3.5 of the percentage of the population actually uh, is on the streets. Um, that is sufficient to make a quite substantial number of them have a successful impact. Now, if you look at climate, um, we know that just in the last five years, from the Yale studies, that more than 70% now of Americans, around 70%, uh, think it's happening, worried, human cost, and it will harm Americans. So a sudden shift here going on, very promising. And in Sweden, uh, climate is now just mentioned as the most important issue for the EU May elections, with 20% um, of people putting this as a top mention. Uh, we have the, ex the, the uh, Extinction Rebellion going on currently, uh, trying to uh, shift the tipping point. And I just saw this on Twitter today. And um, so where are we yet? Are we there yet? Now, the bad news is that there seems to be no magic number or way to predict the timing of social tipping points. For instance, Occupy Wall Street movement fizzled out with little results. And despite 63% of Americans supporting higher taxes on the rich, still Congress gave the rich more tax cuts in late 2017. But this exact unpredictability is in a way the good news too. When tipping points do occur, they come as a surprise. So it may happen on climate already next month. What we do know is that it never happened without a committed minority that kept going and going in spite of seemingly hopeless odds. So on top of this hard working minority, there needs to be one of these unexpected events that no communication professional or spin doctor can even think of. So who expected the power of a lady on the front row of a bus? Who expected the power of an apalm bombed nine-year-old? Or the political oomph of a drowned three-year-old Syrian boy? Who expected a 29-year-old Puerto Rican waitress to bring the better angels out in the American psyche and politics with a new vision that changed the conversation? And who expected a 16-year-old girl with Asperger's and two braids to take on the elite and start leading the world? So these things put us in a deep place of not knowing, of skepticism in the philosophical sense of an open, curious mind. Nobody knows enough, really, to be an absolute cocksure pessimist and say there will be no social tipping point. The good news is that we can go on acting with the sure knowledge that surprising tipping points do happen, but that their timing is beyond our at least scientific capacity to predict. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Perez Penstocknes. This, Perez Pen, you, you uh, play the part of the first part of the first act of this conference called the art of communi communicating a climate, uh, climate crisis.
so now we are moving on to another keynote speaker. Her name is Catherine Hayhoe. So this is the first act we're into now. Catherine Hayhoe, she is an atmospheric scientist that crunches the data. She analyzes the models and she uh, helps engineers and city managers all over the world and also ecologists to quantify the impacts of climate change. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe, there she is. Hello, Catherine. She is with us from Texas, United States. And Catherine, you will talk about different ways of acting on climate change. Please give her a warm hand. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to participate in this conference virtually, and I hope that it is just the first of many that we do in this way. So I live in the United States, and I am often on social media, on Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and more. And when I am there, I often see things like this. Just a minute. Here we go. I often get comments like this. How are you profiting off this fraud? Or you are crazy. Don't you know that CO2 is plant food? And people often think, well, of course you see these things because you live in the United States. But I'm sorry to say that I look at every single comment I get, and many of them are from Canada, my own country. Quite a few of them are from Australia or the United Kingdom. I see them from people in Norway and Switzerland, even a few from Southeast Asia, and once in a while one from Africa too. But I do live in the United States, and the United States is known as one of the countries where the largest number of people reject the scientific consensus that climate is changing and humans are responsible. This is polling data from last year. Anywhere that is blue means that less than 50% of people agree with the statement at the top. Anywhere that is orange means more than 50% of people agree. And when we look at this, we think, wow, well, clearly, people just need more information. Because if you have large areas of the country that are blue, if we just tell them the facts, surely they will change their minds. Well, we did exactly that. I was a lead author on the US National Climate Assessment, which is actually the most up-to-date assessment of the state of the science in the world today, until the next IPCC report comes out. So volume one, which I served as a co-author writing about future scenarios and models and the possibility of unpleasant surprises in the climate system, volume one clocked in at over 400 pages. It was written by 50 different authors. And it goes through the science very clearly what's happening in the Arctic, what's happening in the oceans, what's happening to our temperature and our rainfall, our storms, our droughts, our wildfires and more. But at the same time, you can summarize volume one in just one sentence. Climate is change is real. It's us. It's serious. And the window of time to prevent widespread dangerous impacts is closing fast. Did it change minds? These are a few of the headlines that followed the report. The president confuses climate change with weather again. The White House says the dire climate report is based on the most extreme scenarios. When in fact, of course, as all scientists do, we included all scenarios. And of the climate scientists are just driven by the money, despite the fact that we're paid zero dollars to write this report. But when they asked me right after this report was published, they said, do you think this report will change people's minds? I said, no, I don't think it will. If somebody is not already on board or they're disengaged and they feel like it doesn't matter, more information about ocean acidification or attribution is not what will change their minds. Because the biggest problem we have, even in the United States, and if we have this problem in the United States, then clearly I think we have it in many places around the world. The biggest problem we have is not that people think that global warming is not real. This is a map when they ask people, do you think global warming is happening? Almost everywhere in the entire United States, is orange. That means yes. The darker the color, the higher the number. Then you say, do you think global warming will harm plants and animals? Again, everybody says yes. Do you think global warming will harm future generations? You might think these are the same maps, but they're not. They're different maps. The answer again is yes. Everybody says yes. It's real. It will harm plants and animals. It will harm future generations. Do you think it will harm people in developing countries? 
a little bit more blue, not too much. Do you think it will harm people in the US? Uh, a little bit more blue. And then, do you think it will harm us? This is the problem. We don't think it matters to us. And so more information about the science is not what will change people's minds when the number one image that we think of when people say global warming is an animal that very few people have seen in real life. If it's only about the polar bear, why should it matter? Of course, that isn't true. And that's why when we talk about climate change, the first most important thing to talk about is how it matters to us in the places where we live. It matters to us because it supersizes our rain and flood events. When we just look at headlines around the world, we see headlines from a year and a half ago that a third of Bangladesh is underwater. We see headlines that Houston is experiencing its third 500 year flood in three years. We see flash floods in Indonesia, more flooding in the US and the Midwest. This is happening not at the Arctic, not at the Antarctic, but where we live. And that's why climate change matters because it takes naturally occurring risks because of course flood and drought are natural and it makes them worse. We see headlines of drought in Spain, in Syria, in Texas where I live and California. Again, drought is natural, but it is being exacerbated, amplified, made worse by a changing climate. We see even headlines here in Texas about how we are being affected by a changing climate. We see stories about how wildfires in California are breaking records again and again and again, three times in less than a year for the largest wildfire burned. The reason we care about a changing climate is because it takes the risks we already face today and it exacerbates them and makes them worse. So when we talk about a changing climate, we need to talk about how it affects us and the places where we live. And these things are changing today. In a new poll that just came out in January, it showed that the biggest jump has occurred in people's levels of concern about a changing climate. And that's good news, but it isn't enough good news. We also need to talk not just about why climate change matters to us, we also need to talk about what we can do to fix it. We can talk about things that we are doing ourselves, including what we're doing right now. We are having a no-fly, zero-carbon conference. We can talk about how our diet matters, how our choices matter. I love talking about what's actually happening in unexpected places like churches and universities. What's happening in places like the state where I actually live, where you have entire army bases going clean energy and the first carbon neutral airport in North America. Talking about solutions is so important, but not just solutions where we live, but solutions that work for people around the world. Educating women and girls, clean cook stove projects, biochar, reducing food waste. If food waste were its own country, it would be one of the top greenhouse gas emitters after China and the US. The bottom line is that to fix this thing, we need hope. And for hope, we need to talk about climate change. But when we talk about it, not just talk about the science, talk about why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I know you're still with us, even there, there you are. Um, when you talk to people that do not care, because we all run into pe these people that go, like, they shrug their shoulders and they go, huh. Do you have any good advice? Because I totally share your opinion about talking about all the actions, all the good examples, etc. But how about the ones that are just not really listening? How do we reach them? I do. And in my TED Talk, I talk about more, this in more detail, but the bottom line is just about everyone has values that they need to care, but they have not connected the dots. Mm -hmm. So if they don't care, the first thing we need to do is listen to them, mm. ask them questions, find out what matters to them. Do they care about their children, about sports, about the economy? What do they care about? Mm -hmm. And nine times out of 10, we can connect the dots 
between what they already care about and a changing climate. Great. They have just not made that connection before. So for more examples, check out my TED Talk. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Catherine Hayhoe. Another warm applause. It's now time for our first panel discussion here up on stage. We'll have some rearranging of the furniture. Uh, we have uh, four people in the panel. Uh, they're headed up here. We have Osa Elmstam. Osa is jewelry craftsman with a focus on sustainability. We have Pietro Modesti, who's a film director involved in climate action. And we have Grant Price. And Grant Price will have his first climate novel out in September. He is British, uh, but living currently in Berlin. And we have Klaus Thuyman who is director of Project Pressure, which is a charity visualizing climate change. Um, and uh, Klaus, you also have a degree in environmental science. And I guess there is a chair for me too. Wonderful. All right. What would you like to say about what you just heard uh, on the sharing of good examples? Would you like to start? Um, well, uh, I mean, as a writer, I'm always thinking about those things, uh, trying to set uh, examples. Um, and try to connect the dots, basically. Mm. Um, but I don't believe in, like, solving any, everything at once. I believe in telling different stories, uh, which connects the dots and makes, like, connection to, to yourself, basically. And w what are your shortcomings and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, while you're at it, could you please tell us about how you work, your film director, right. and how does that connect? Would you work with climate climate uh, action? Um, I'm I'm writing um, several feature films. Um, they're in different stages right now. Um, for myself as a director, sometimes a couple of them are with me as a director, and uh, a couple is uh, just a screenwriter. Or Great, because we haven't seen many. I mean, no. Dear Tomorrow. Uh, not really. I mean, the day after tomorrow, and that's about it. Yeah, so we need yeah. we need more uh, in this well, field. Well, we need like an anthology of stories because the the enemy or the antagonist in real life is uh, climate change is like an enemy with a thousand heads, basically. Mm -hmm. So we need we need like all the stories we can achieve, um, big, small, set, present time, in the future, like Grant's mm -hmm. novel, and um, yeah, yeah, thank you as much as possible. <laughs> Greg Price, uh, tell us about your work. Okay, so the, the, the novel is, um, so it takes place against the backdrop of uh, a world ravaged by global warming and explores uh, what it means to be a human being um, when you no longer have social structures, infrastructure, when we've severed our connection to nature and when you can no longer rely on other people. And I think uh, I kind of focused on this because we, as artists now have a, a very big opportunity to engage with the, the one subject that matters. Um, so like in the 1920s, you had the lost generation, 1960s, you had the counterculture movement, and now we are the, the climate generation. And so to, to ignore that would be, um, it wouldn't be right. I mean, you'd be missing a, a, a huge audience. It's, I mean, you have an audience of seven billion people because it affects everybody. So um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's why I chose to, to, to focus on this, this future like this uh, what the world could look like it's, it's exaggerated but it's um it's, it's based on fact and the title of your book is by the feet of men yes um that's a uh, part of a quote by henry david thoreau mm -hmm. which says uh, the world is soft and impressionable by the feet of men and so mm -hmm. the uh the past that the mind walks and that basically means we, it's very easy for human beings to get stuck in a rut and think in the same ways that we've always been thinking. Mm. But there are other alternatives and we can think outside the box and we can approach the, the problem from different angles. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm. Look forward to reading your book. Thanks. And watching your films, of course. Also, Amstam, uh, you're a jewelry <laughs> designer and that might be, oh, that's a bit odd. How do you, how do you relate to climate uh, action? Yeah. Um, after studying in art school, craft-based art, school, art schools for many years. I graduated in Stockholm and uh, Tokyo and fell down in a deep depression, like realizing 2007 mm. that the climate crisis... It, I, it, yeah, I understood it 2007 mm. and I was like, what the hell am I going to do now? Because I can't continue doing this, producing things to a society which doesn't need any more things produced. Mm. And after a little while, I 
after the deep being deep, deep down, I realized that I have to use my skills, my craft to communicate and, and um, uh, visualize my problems uh, or the, the world's problems instead. Try to do, try to work it with my in my way. So that's what I'm doing. I'm using my craft skills to try to visualize for a broader public. And you communicate in your art, but also with the, uh, the, the, the sort of packaging or text or explanations that will make people understand, too, I understand? It's not, I don't do commercial jewelry at all. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do like unique pieces for exhibitions or for projects. So every, mostly I'm doing very unique pieces, just like art pieces, small mm -hmm. art pieces. Wonderful. And then yeah. people will understand in the context of it all. Yeah. Terrific. So, Klaus Thiemann, uh, tell us about your work, and I know Project Pressure, uh, we're interested in what that is. Yeah, I founded Project Pressure in 2008, and that was with the idea of visualizing climate change with a clear view that scientific facts, uh, they've been known for decades. Mm. I mean, it, it would go back to the 70s, late 70s, we knew about climate change. The facts haven't changed. How they've been communicated, denied, whatever, that, that, that's a whole narrative uh, that we've gone through. What I felt uh, was needed was a visualization of climate change that had a little bit of hope, that had an inspirational touch point where you could engage with a really incredibly depressing subject in a positive way. So it wouldn't be arms on cross, it would be, okay, this is something I can love and embrace. That's mm -hmm. what art can do. Art can make people Absolutely. feel, it can capture the emotions. And with Project Pressure, we thought, what is the best way of visualizing climate change? Well, we've gone through the wildfires, the flooding, blah, 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 and, and they're all weather-related. Glacier recession is 100% attributed to climate change, and such as such are key indicators. It also goes back to landscape art, and is a very uh, broad category within the art spectrum. So that's why we chose to visualize climate change uh, using glaciers. Uh, having developed that project, we're launching a traveling exhibition this year called Meltdown, a visualization of climate change that will be traveling to museums. But we have a small preview here with some posters that uh, mix the art uh, with some hard hitting facts. Thank you, Klaus. We're going to move down in a few minutes to, to watch, look at the, look at the posters. Um, so, uh, what references do you see, all of you, anybody can answer, uh, between your work and just the hard facts that you've been presented earlier on this day? What, how can you sort of interact and relate on a deeper and a deeper level. Grant, would you like well, I to? Think, I think, as I said before, you, the facts are all well and good, and it's very interesting, and, and you get all these uh, graphs and, and whatever, but um, at some point you need somebody to, to take those facts and turn mm. it into a story and make it something, make the unpalatable palatable. Um, I mean, you still need this underlying sense of discomfort, but you need to take the facts and use them as building blocks for something else, something that people can digest. Because the more you, you bombard people with uh, sort of raw data, the less they're going to be receptive to it. They, they switch off. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a, like a sandwich. You need, you, you've, got, you've got the filling, but you need to put the bread there so you can actually eat it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with art, then, it's, it's a way of presenting that in a way that people can actually take on and understand. Um, especially like in a place like this, um, there's a lot of very intelligent people here. There's a lot of scientists. And it's people who understand this data, but um, this is kind of an echo chamber. You need... Mm. Uh, you need art to speak to people who won't necessarily be watching this, who might not come to a place like this, but they might go into a store and pick up a book. They might go uh, to a, a gallery and, and look at some photos. Mm. So you, that's what you need, basically. Mm. Also, and then, Klaus, uh, when people see your jewellery, how do they respond? It's hard for me to know sometimes how they respond, but... I had a few moments when people really act and responded very emotional, mm. which is fantastic. And if you're present, you can open up for a dialogue yeah, yeah, with, of course. with them about climate action. Yeah, I, I do. I've been doing a film. You can see it down there in one of the small rooms uh -huh. as well. And lots of different objects and sculptures. But mostly I'm doing things that are body related and walking around with a piece of art jewelry on you, which says mm, something mm. about the climate really that has an impact on like power in, in spreading a 
spreading something Absolutely. that you want to say. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Klaus? Yeah, for, for me, there's, there's something with time and timings and, and that, that we need to discuss and address. And uh, having discussed the glacier recession, which is a known phenomenon as a glacier speed, mm. is kind of ironic because what is happening is that the projections of the scientific reports are actually the, uh, the disaster zone is being downgraded. as It's, it's happening sooner than we thought. Uh, 10 years ago, oh, there's 30 years. Now there's, 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 there isn't time. I mean, let's forget it. Climate change is happening now. It's not wildfires tomorrow. It's, it's last year. The earth is burning. This is happening now. We have an exp exponential time acceleration of the consequences, yet we're discussing solutions that are linear in, in response. And we're responding as if we have a linear uh, path to choose. And we don't. We, we, we have to take very drastic steps right the second. And, and the solutions we're discussing as privileged individuals aren't enough. Uh, it, there, there are industries that need to change, the, the governments need to change, and it needs to happen not tomorrow but now. That's the thing, and that's the urgency, and that's the, that's the thing that I find so difficult to, to get across, is that there, there just is not time. Like, it needs to happen now. And of course, in the field of art, there lies a possibility of really sort of breaking through those barriers and those walls quicker than anything else. Do you agree? Yeah. Mm. Uh, like you said before, um, um, the day after tomorrow was one of the first, or mm, well, um, it's about climate change, but still, I, I don't know how much there was a lot of good intention, but I don't know how mm. much good it uh, actually achieved. But uh, yeah, I think a movie like Interstellar maybe uh, gave some sort of recognition to it mm -hmm. because uh, um, Interstellar. It's about the Dust Bowl period in the US, and it's also very connected to 0.1 uh, centigrade uh, warming, the, that w world, where Oklahoma and uh, that area turns into basically a desert. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking that stuff that Grant mentioned before, you mentioned trust, which is something that I've, um, I've seen. I, I mean, I'm working with four, maybe six feature films at the same time. And the common value at stake seems to be trust. There are other values in the films, of course, but that's the most common value in all of those. I don't think I'll ever be able to write like a fiction on climate w related to climate change because it's not about climate change; it's related to it. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to write it without trust as a value at stake yeah. because it's so tightly connected: trust in people, but also tr trust in politics or uh, um, like big values mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah trust in your message as well mm -hmm. yeah I mean it, what you were just saying is if you look at what David Attenborough is doing right now mm. in the past that's powerful couple of years yeah. he's released three documentaries mm. that have changed a lot of people's minds mm. um, that basically led to a, a blanket ban on plastic bags um, <laughs> which uh, that wasn't on the cards before mm. and and he did that alone effectively and now with our planet mm -hmm. It's another voice, and also there was a, a documentary last week, I think it's called Climate Change, The Question. Um, so yeah, art, art can definitely get straight to the heart of the matter. Mm. I mean, if you're someone like David Attenborough. <laughs> well, we are very happy for your work in different sections with jewelry, with literature, with film, and Klaus with your project Pressure. We're gonna move down to Plaza Major, uh, you and I, Klaus, and, and look at the posters for a bit. Thank you so much for your work and um, keep it up and we'll be following you. Yeah. I'll be interested to look at your stuff, your beautiful jewelry, I've seen it online, and read your book when it pu is published and watch your films. So keep us posted and uh, we'll just keep, uh, keep an eye on these wonderful people doing their utmost for, for the future Thank of you. the next generation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're now going to head down to uh, visit two uh, students. And these two students you have not met yet, Klaus. Uh, but I'd just like to ask you, what is your take on how important it is to collaborate with other uh, organizations and just the younger generation more specifically? The idea, with, not the idea, but the, the, the issue with climate change is that it's cross-sectorial, mm -hmm. it's uh, cross-political, it goes across every single spectrum of life. I mean, you cannot pick up a glass of water, mm. go into any mode of transportation without 
thinking of climate change if that's what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. And if you have a complex problem that needs a complex solution, you also need a cross-sectorial collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think collaboration is key to solving the climate crisis. It's not one thing we need to do. We need to do many things. If we need to do many things, we need to employ everyone. And this is why we're here with you now here. Uh, this is Vigo Jepson. You're from the Climate Students International. And Emma Berlin, you're from Climate Students Sweden. And you're here and behind you, you see from Project Pressure, uh, some of your posters here, Klaus. And this you is the first time you met. Yes, hello. Wonderful. Yeah. Hi. Say hello, please. Nice Good to meet you. Meet you. Wonderful. Good to meet you. Wonderful. Yeah. So Vigo, please tell us about uh, this Climate Student International. What is it? Climate Students International is the, the next step in our climate student movement. We started in Sweden barely a year ago, and we've grown very fast. And now it's time to keep that momentum and expand internationally. So that's what we're doing now, and that's why we're here. Uh, and we're going to use the We Don't Have Time social platform to do that. Wonderful. And Emma, tell us how, you gonna, what, how, do, how do you work with, with Klaus's project pressure and, and the posters? Yeah. Uh, so here in Sweden, we have a, a competition between our universities that we in Climate Movement has started. Mm -hmm. uh, so the goal is to make the universities reduce their emissions in line with their own science in order to reach the 1.5 uh -huh. degrees. Walk the talk. Yeah. That's right. Practice what they teach. Mm. Mm. Um, so this, these posters or your artwork is going to be the prizes in this competition. Uh -huh. So who will get the prizes? Who will be winning? Uh, the university does th that does best. So ah. we're, we're uh, thinking about having some different prizes in different categories to not uh, just reward those who have uh, uh, reduced their emissions the most, but also in percentage and stuff like that. And the hashtag is practice what you teach. Is that correct? Yeah. That's right. So if you want to follow this online, it's pra hashtag pra practice what you teach. Yeah. Wonderful. Klaus, um, what is your take on this, what they're doing? Well, I think uh, if I was a student today, then I would say, uh, well, um, sorry guys, but we're kind of inheriting an earth that is not really what we wanted. And uh, there's a certain set of guilt for my generation mm. and from, I think, the past generation should feel Absolutely. more guilty. But if we want to solve the problem, uh, what's happening with uh, student activism is fantastic because it actually might be the kick up, uh, wake up call for, for the older generation to start getting their act together and not burn earth uh, death. And so what you guys are doing is really important. I think this, the feedback mechanisms, mechanisms that, we, that we see, where one thing feeds into the other, feeds into the next, we have the science. Okay, science can't communicate on its own. Maybe we can use art to communicate. Mm. But if the students can activate the political sphere, then I think we're on a path that could be really positive. So that's what I'm hoping for. And we're so grateful you're doing this and that you're joining arms with We Don't Have Time. And so say again your hashtag into the camera, please. Practice, Practice what, what you, you teach. teach. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Vigo. Thank you, Emma. Thank, thank you. you. And I'm going to head back to Town Hall and thank you, Klaus. Thank you. It's important to talk about all the aspects of society, and, but how do we go from, from action to, uh, I mean, to, from values to action? It's gonna, we're going to talk to Chris Johnston now, who is uh, waiting for us on the big stage here on Town Hall. I hope, hope he's ready for us. Hi. Um, yes, welcome. I'm here. Wonderful, I can hear you, Chris. Great. And don't forget to visit all the um, wonderful art studios down there at Plaza Mayor when you have a break later on. Here he is. Well, he is not with us on stage, but on the other side of the, uh, well, some kind of water. You're with us from Scotland. This is wonderful. That's right. Mm. That's right. And uh, Chris, I'll have to give you a nice proper intro here. Your co-author of Active Hope and Resilience Specialist at collegeofwellbeing.com. And um, you suggest that we should look at the way we communicate with ourselves, um, how we listen to ourselves, and how we talk to ourselves, uh, to that, and that, that can make a crucial difference. So please give Chris Johnston a warm hand. Thank you, thank you. Um, we're on the art of communicating the climate crisis. And I want to say that one of the most people, most important people to communicate with is ourselves, particularly when we're facing this question, what helps us face the mess we're in and respond with active hope? And I wanted to say a bit about what I mean by active hope, that the word hope you can use in different ways. So one is with the question, 
are you hopeful? And I'm, uh, uh, for me, my level of hopefulness, it rises and falls. And sometimes I don't feel so hopeful. And I work a lot with people who don't feel at all hopeful. And a lot of my work is running workshops that helps us um, strengthen our capacity to face our concerns about the world. And I find a more helpful question is, what do you hope for? That even if you're hopeless, you may be clear what you hope for. It's a more motivating question. And then looking at how you make your hopes more likely to occur. And I think of active hope, it's not so much something that you have. It's something that you do. It's something that you can do every day. A practice, a bit like some people do Tai Chi, a practice every day to support well-being. Active hope is a practice we can do every day to support the well-being of our world and also ourselves in that. Um, it's something we do rather than have. And in that, I find helpful what I call a spider diagram. The spider diagram, if you imagine a spider on its side, where uh, the body is the present moment, each leg is the way things can go. And there's better ways things can go and worse ways things can go. And I was just hearing um, Asa Elmstrom, the, the jewelry, jewelry maker, just a few minutes ago. She was saying that uh, she had a deep, um, deep, die fell into depression uh, which is very common when we encounter disturbing information about climate change and what i'm interested in is even when we find ourselves on one of the worst dips of the um the spider one of the worst legs that we can still respond there we can uh, look at what helps us rise to the occasion whether that be a turning in the world or a turning in our lives and what i, I look at is what i call active hope training Active hope training is about how we nourish and cultivate our capacity, intention and enthusiasm to make a difference in, a world, in the world. And what I'd like to invite you all to take part in now is just a very short conversation with yourself. It can also be a conversation with other people when we have more time to nudge and nourish our response of active hope when we're concerned about the world. And I'm very influenced by my close work over more than three decades with Joanna Macy, an American writer who's been doing a work around strengthening people's capacity to respond to world concerns for over 40 years. And she invites us to take part in this um, spiral, spiral of the work that reconnects these four steps. And I want to introduce a short form that we can do in just about five minutes. So um, we're gonna start with gratitude and gratitude is nourishing. I think at the roots of a plant, it's what you draw in, uh, what sustains you, what keeps you going. And I'd just like you to um, have a sentence starter. This invite you to think about this now, a sentence starter that begins with, for supporting me to live, I give thanks to. So this is something that you can do in your own time, it, uh, uh, you, something that you can do for supporting me to live, I give thanks to. Who do you support for support? Who, who does support you? I think when I take a big breath in, invite you to do this with me, take a big breath in. On Mars, there's no oxygen. On Venus, there's no oxygen. We have about 20% oxygen. And for supporting me to live, I give thanks to all plant life, that without that plant life, we wouldn't have the oxygen. And when you give attention to what's supporting you, the natural systems that are supporting us, you may also open to the horror of what's happening to them. The, and the, this really moves to the next part of the spiral, honoring our pain for the world. And I wanna hold the question, well, how do we feel? Um, how do we deal with the feelings that come up when we look at the mess that we're in? It's such an important question because quite often people look at the mess and they think that's too depressing. I just don't wanna look, I'm just gonna turn away. And while that's understandable, it actually blocks our response. And so the way we hold our pain can make a crucial difference. And I want to look at three ways of holding our pain. The first is in the meaning that we give to it. What meaning do we give? Do we think this is just dep too depressing, I don't want to look? Or do we see the, the meaning of pain is that it functions as an alarm call that can alert us to danger? I think of it as a call to adventure that starts us off, it alerts us to a threat. 
but also in terms of um, if we just think we're the only person feeling this way, we can feel isolated with it. And so what we do is set up groups and um, support conversations where we can acknowledge how we feel when facing the climate crisis, but also have trusted practices that help us be with feelings of disturbance without getting overwhelmed. And that's what we're doing just now. We're doing a trusted practice. It's called Open Sentences. Um, sentence starters we have a beginning of a sentence and we see what naturally follows so here's the next one when i look out at the world what concerns me is just inviting you to give your attention to that right now when i look out at the world what concerns me is and then just for a moment give um just wonder well, what feelings come up when you think about this so when I look out at the world, what concerns me is, and feelings I have about this inc include. We get people in groups to have this conversation together. I write it down in my notebook. Um, and often think just, you know, well, when I look out at the world, what concerns me? What feelings come up? Those feelings can be a source of energy. We can learn to draw on them and they can also guide us. I have feelings of alarm, of horror, of fear. And, and it's helpful to be providing space to honor those feelings, but then see that as the starting point of an adventure. We go on a quest to look at what helps us respond. And that's where we move to the next part of this spiral, which is about, um, I call it seeing with new eyes. Seeing with new eyes is recognizing that what we see depends on how we look. And so, for example, I've got here a, a ring of, of squares. One way of looking is to guide it by the question, what's it made of? You can focus on the pieces, but you can also look at a piece and say, what's it part of? And we can look at ourselves and say, what are we part of? You can look at an action that you take for climate change and you say, what's that part of? Larger stories happen through the different scenes. Larger patterns happen through their parts. Larger systems act through their parts. And so a really um, useful uh, sentence starter I'm gonna invite you to think of is, what happens through me? What happens through me is, you can do this every day. Just say, what happens through me? What happens through me is, because we have choices, we shape what happens through us. It could be the story of business as usual happens through us. It could be heavy use of fossil fuels happens through us. It could be that collectively a mass extinction event is happening through us and the way that we collectively as a human species act on this planet, particularly in industrialized societies. But also our choices steer and shape the flow of what happens through us. And this idea of active hope every day, it's a practice we can engage in, being active to support the future we hope for. And if we do that every day, what happens through us or what can happen through us is the recovery of our world. And this leads to then the next part of this um, spiral going forth. Going forth is looking at what's our role, what's our part. And a sentence starter here is a place I want to focus my energy is. So I'm introducing a practice. It's a way of having a conversation with ourselves. It can also be a conversation that happens between people where every day we say, OK, for supporting me to live, I give thanks to. When I look out at the world, what concerns me is and feelings that come up about this are. What happens through me is. And in order to influence and shape what happened through me is a place I want to focus my energy is. And through that, what happens is we give our gift of active hope. Our gift of active hope is our contribution to this larger story of change. We don't have time to wait. We do have time to act. The story of active hope, the practice of active hope can happen through us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris Johnson. That was beautiful. And I'm curious, when you speak to other people, when we talk to and interact with other people, how can we apply this beautiful circle, this, this method in this, in this communication? 
One of the ways is to be interested in what we're grateful for and to have that as a conversation, to have perhaps if we have a meeting on climate change, um, uh, gratitude is a motivator in the same way that fear and alarm are. They're both important. It's not that one's more or less important than the other, but also we feel differently when we're acting from our gratitude, when we want to give back to what supports us. But I think the other thing is that when we have a conversation about our alarm, our distress, when we have our dips of depression about this, we don't turn away. We just provide a space to hear that and to acknowledge that as a vital um, alarm call that our world is in distress. And then have the conversation saying, well, okay, what inspires me and what's my part? So these four things of gratitude, honoring our pain, of seeing with new eyes and going forth. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.